Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our August 27th, 2020 school reopening update. It's so wonderful to be able to present uh, a little more information about our plan to you. As our community is aware, we have delayed the start of in-person learning in the school district for the vast majority of students by six days. Uh, so we'll speak to that in a little more detail. With all I'm going to share with you today, I do want you to know that we anticipate that French Hills Re Satellite Remote Learning Center will be operational on September 8th, which would have been the first day of in-person learning had we maintained the original calendar. So that will be operational. We will be sending out the registration. I believe that's coming out tomorrow. So we'll send an email with the time that the registration will go live as well as the link. And then the registration will go live a little bit later in the day. So just to remind you, we have 100 seats available on A days, 100 seats available on B days. And uh, I do anticipate that the seats in the program will fill very quickly. So I would encourage you to ensure that you log in and register for the program. If, if you so are interested in doing so, you're welcome to do so. But I would encourage you to do so as close to the registration time as possible so that you have the highest likelihood of securing a seat in the program. So there is a lot of information to share with you this evening. And we'll begin, first of all, I want to thank Mrs. O'Shea for joining me this evening. Thank you again, Mrs. O'Shea, for being here. Thank you to Mrs. Forsberg and, and Ms. Burns for joining us this evening. We are going to spend our evening speaking about these six days and giving some more information so that uh, our community can be clear on, on what the expectations are for each of these respective days. We'll also speak about, I'm sorry, open to the hybrid model, sorry. Uh, we'll also speak about some of the questions and answers that have come up and we'll absolutely address those. And um, we'll also spend a little time talking about the remote and the hybrid models. We have a board of education meeting on Monday, August 31st at 7 p.m. I will be giving my next community update at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, September 1st. I hope you can join for either or both of those meetings. With regard to this evening, we'll begin by talking about the calendar. And I just wanna share the thinking behind the, the six and, and for those who have eighth, 11th or 12th grade children, the eight day change to the start of the school year. So there were a few things, and some of what I'll share with you is a little redundant with the letter because I did want to share the rationale behind the decision in the letter. I will share not only the information that was in the letter, but I'll also elaborate on some of the points to provide greater, greater clarity uh, behind the decisions that we made and the rationale behind those decisions, because every decision that we make is, is very thoughtful and very strategic and, and intentional. There, there is no change on September 2nd and September 3rd. Faculty and staff will be on site for staff development days. Now, on the 4th, we're asking no faculty and staff or students to be here because we need to complete our PPE installation. And that will happen over uh, Friday and the weekend. We've already begun with the PPE installation. I was visiting one of our elementary schools today and I was delighted to see the MERV 13 filters in place in, in many of the classrooms. I'm delighted to see the barriers in some of the office spaces already up and, and the sinks are due to arrive, arrive in district on Tuesday, the additional sinks to our district. So we're excited to see progress in that regard. With regard to the two superintendent conference days, there's a lot of training that happens in a normal school year. In any given school year, we have two professional development days at the front end of the school year. We set our instructional goals. We calibrate our vision for the district and for the school year. We inspire each other. We commit to our students, recommit ourselves to the profession, are just so excited to be back and to welcome back our students. 
that's in a given school year. We go over curricular changes, grade level changes, different uh, professional development goals that we have for the year, and different initiatives that we'll be working on, and, and some of the areas of focus for our school district. Now, when you take a, the year of COVID and a reopening in COVID, which I will tell you with in no uncertain terms, this is the most complex endeavor that I have faced in my career. And I think I can point to Mrs. O'Shea has had a longer career than I have, and I think she would agree with that. And our principals would share as well that this is probably the most challenging reopening of schools that we have ever faced. There are so many different factors that have to be considered that add to the complexity. And with each what if situation that you encounter, the complexity just increases exponentially. So we, on the school calendar, you can have a maximum, you can have, um, we have four professional development days here in Yorktown. So we have the two at the front of the school year. In any given year, we usually have election day and then we have one at the end of the year to really get ourselves situated for the summer and planning for the summer. So we've decided to take those two days, the November 3rd, professional development day, the June 25th professional development day, move those to the front of the year. We thought that those days would best serve us on the front end of the school year. Not unique to Yorktown, many school districts have taken that approach. And you'll be hearing about more districts taking that approach. With regard to September 8th, September 8th is now a superintendent's conference day. It has taken the place of November 3rd, which was a superintendent's conference day, but is now a day for students. So students will report. It's a Tuesday as well. So the same A day, uh, a group of students on an A day would report to school in person. And the students who are on the B day, the last names M through Z, would learn remotely. For September 9th, June 25th was a Friday which is a B day of instruction. September 9th is a B day for students to be here in person. It's, it's a change of days. So now on June 25th, that will be a day of instruction for students as September 9th becomes a staff development day. There is no net loss of instructional time. We certainly understand the delay, but there is no net loss of instructional time. With regard to September 10th and 11th, all students, all students, regardless of whether they're fully remote or on the hybrid model, will participate in September 10th and 11th remotely. So all students will participate in both days remotely. A detailed schedule will follow, will provide information. But one of the things that prompted this was much of the concern that I've heard from parents within our community. And what I've heard is, Dr. Hatter, we trust what the school's doing. We really do. We're so impressed by the steps the school is taking to keep the children safe. And I appreciate those kind words. But what follows that is, but we're still scared. We're still nervous to come back to school. We didn't go to camp this summer. We didn't take a vacation this summer. We really haven't ventured out much. And we're a little nervous. And I hope you understand that. And I absolutely understand that. And I'm so sensitive to that. And in these conversations, and they have been dozens and dozens of conversations that I've had with parents about the uneasiness and the uneasy feeling about coming back to school. Trusting, but scared. We're going to gradually ease our faculty and staff and our students back into the school year with remote learning days and remote orientations. That's on the 10th for all students, irrespective of uh, whether they're in a fully remote or a hybrid model. And on the 11th, it will be a different program on the 11th. So it's a two day welcome back. I will be giving 
an address to our students over those two days. Uh, I'm not sure which school I will address on, on a given day. We're working through the schedule. There will be uh, presentations from the school nurses, from the building principals, from technology, about the arrival and dismissal procedures. And, and we'll be talking about all of those changes to the school year, the 10th and the 11th. You will receive information prior to that, but the 10th and the 11th will be an orientation. I can't wait to connect with our students virtually on, on September 10th, as I walk through the halls of their schools and, and just remind them of this place of the school that they left behind so abruptly in March, hoping I can read a story to our elementary school's children and share with them my excitement for their return and, and how much we're looking forward to having our students back in our schools. That's a process and we understand that. And that process is a really delicate one. And now when the other part of our phased reopening is this idea of, of the orientation to a new school. Many children are returning to their schools, the same school they were in last year, and they're nervous. And now I can't even imagine starting a new school under these circumstances. We weren't able to have the orientations that we always have where the children come over to the school and they meet the different office staff and administrators and nurse and custodian and, and food service staff and the teachers, we couldn't have that opportunity. Our students couldn't have that opportunity. And to think that we could proceed without an orientation was probably not an accurate assumption. It's probably not a correct assumption to make. So we are putting an, an orientation in. Now, as I think about our kindergarten students, half of their pre-K year was taken away from them. And is it correct to think that we can just put them into a kindergarten class, say goodbye and move on into the instructional day? I don't think that's the case. I think we need to have an orientation for our students who are starting a new school year, especially our kindergarten students, but also for our ninth grade students who are starting high school. High school can be a scary place and a scary thing. I don't think our high school is, but it can be. I understand that. I, I can understand that feeling. This orientation is so important to our students. And because we're in a hybrid model with an A day and a B day, you have to do it over two days. Now, for the kindergarten parents and, and uh, guardians who are watching this presentation, it will be a partial day for kindergarten because we do want a parent or a guardian to join for the orientation. You're starting the journey in our schools as well. And we'd like to make sure that we've answered your questions as well. So we will have a group come in in the morning on, of the A-Day group. You, you'll have that information as soon as we're able to provide it. We'll do a disinfection of the room and then we'll have another group of A-Day students and their parent or guardian come in during the second half of that day. Now, on the 15th, as the K-4 sixth and ninth grade students are in school and are learning, the other students in the other grade levels, the students in the other grade levels will be learning remotely. For those who are in a fully remote model at the elementary level, their program of study will begin on the 14th. For those who are in the hybrid model, they will begin on the 15th with the grade levels that are noted in the calendar on the screen. The remainder of the students will learn remotely on those days. And I have um, added to the calendar to clarify the expectations on the given days. And I know it's a lot of information, I do. And we'll be packaging this in more building level um, with more building level information or building specific information moving forward. On the 17th, so we have the orientation days for our students on the 15th and the 16th. On the 17th, now the vast majority of our students are back in school. It's where I can say the hybrid model begins. We're beyond orientation at this point. Our hybrid model has begun. We've now welcomed back 10 of our 13 grades. So we started with kindergarten, 
at Brookside Mohansic beginning on the 17th. Brookside Mohansic will welcome back all of its students, K through three. Crompon started with fourth grade, they'll phase in another grade. They'll have both grades in the building. The middle school started with sixth grade earlier in the week. They will phase in the next grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. High school started with ninth grade early in the week. They will phase in um, another grade, ninth and 10th grade. And the schedule is um, on the screen for, for your review. The group A students or the A day students, there's some confusion because in the middle school, they have an A day and a B day, which dictates the special schedules. This is different from the students who are attending school on day A or A through L last name and the students attending school on B days or, or, or group B. So we'll refer to them as group A, group B. Um, so the group A students in K one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so K through seven, nine and 10, group A will attend in person. The group B students of those same grades will learn remotely. They will not be in school on that, on that day, on the 17th. And then remote learning will be held for students in grades eight, 11 and 12. And on the 18th, we, we change. The group A students are learning from home or remotely, and the group B students are having their in-person day. And then the following week, we welcome back all of our students and we are into our hybrid model. So the full hybrid model, K-12 across 13 grades begins. Tuesdays and Thursdays, students who are in that group A will attend school in person. Students who are in group B on Tuesdays and Thursdays will attend school, will learn remotely. And then Wednesday and Friday, the group B students will attend in person and the group A students learn remotely. So that in, in some in substance at the highest level is our reopening phase in plan. There were a lot of factors that had to be considered. I shared many of them with you, but there are additional factors that, that are considered and additional details that each what if question you ask opens up. So one of the questions is, you know, we, we, we understand, okay, thank you for sharing that with us. It's a little late, it's close to the start of the school year, sure. I, I do wanna share that a month ago, I believe that announcement would have been premature a month ago because you have a month left to the opening of school. How, how, how do we know? How can we be certain that we won't necessarily be able to open on the 8th when you have a month left? So it comes that time where you get close to the starting point and you recognize, okay, you know what? We will need this number of days. We will need this amount of time to be able to provide the safest possible atmosphere for our students. And that's what this all comes down to. This comes down to providing the safest possible atmosphere for our students. There are new protocols, new procedures, social distancing, mask requirements, mask breaks. There are hand washing stations that are going to be set up. There are changes to lockers, changes to dismissals from classes, changes to lunch procedures, changes to recess procedures, changes to lost and found procedures. So on a given day, as I walk through the school buildings, I see sweatshirts, I see jackets, I see lunch bags and lunch bottles. I anticipate we'll see masks now within the lost and found. How do we address that? Do we just want those things out as they have been? Or do we need to reimagine the way lost and found works? And, and I, I reference lost and found just to share with you, honestly, only to share with you the level of detail that our planning has to encompass. And that's, those are the things that, that our building administrators are certainly working toward. And so Shea and I and our team are working toward. There are many, many details to address. And as you get close to the start of the school year, you, you're able to better assess, okay, this is the amount of time we believe we will need to ensure that everything that we have told our community we're going to provide will be in place. And we believe that we can 
provide what we have promised in this time frame. Now, can that change? It absolutely can change. I would be disingenuous if I told you this is written in stone and it will never change. Infection rates in the town and in the region have the ability to impact this. Staffing requirements can have the ability to change this. So I, I just want to be completely transparent and I know no other way but to be transparent with our school community to tell you that this is where we are right now. You'll, you'll be hearing some different start updates from different districts and, and several have changed, several will be changing. And, and it's a, a function of the unique circumstances that the school district is facing. I'm monitoring the infection rates. I'm, I'm starting to see uh, numbers within our town. I'm starting to see numbers within Westchester, although the overall infection rate seems to be positive according to our medical director. Um, but that's something that we watch every single day. With regard to some of the, and Ms. O'Shea, is there anything that that you wanted to add to the reopening before I move into some of the uh, questions that, that we've received? So I'm thinking about what you started your conversation with, which was this being the most complex situation you've dealt with in your career. And you did indicate that I've had a slightly longer career than you have had, which is true. And I will certainly reiterate that this has been also the most complex situation that I've been involved in. I do know that this piece of paper with the schedule is one part of what our building administrators have been working on so diligently and trying to get things ready for our students and our staff to return. I think that this gives us the time to make sure that we are cognizant of meeting all the needs, both the requirements that we have from the state and the needs of our students and staff as they return. So I, as far as this part of the conversation, I think that you've shared everything that I would have shared. So I have nothing else to add at this point. Thank you, I appreciate that. So some of the things have come up since the last time uh, for our high school athletes, or the parents of high school athletes, there was a letter that was released yesterday by the New York State Superintendents Group that's asking the governor to delay the start of high school sports until January. I just want to make very clear that I do not share that position. I don't agree with that position. I understand the position. I absolutely do. There is enormous complexity in reopening the schools and to add another layer to this, uh, I can understand the burden. Children need sports uh, and there, there's a huge benefit to sports uh, and can it be done safely? I, I believe it can be done safely. So I wanted to share, I, in fact, I was very surprised by that letter. I learned about it in the news and, and yet it represents uh, apparently my perspective on this and that's untrue. So I have mixed feelings, to be honest with you, I do. I have mixed feelings about it. I recognize the value of sports. Sports played a huge part of my life. And when I read that letter, I, I found it very off-putting because children need sports who like sports. Children need music who like music. Children need the arts who like arts. It's an outlet, it's, it's a creative source for children. And that is, something that, that I was a little disappointed by. I do understand the position of the organization putting out that message, but I did want to share publicly with our community that that does not necessarily reflect my opinion on the situation. My opinion on the situation is I am conflicted. I understand both sides of the argument, uh, but I also understand that children need sports. Um, so I, I, I just share that with our school community as that emerged and, and that, that uh, honestly, did surprise me. With regard to schedules, uh, Ms. O'Shea, I believe we're going to be releasing um, schedules next week for the most part. So I know that there was some communication that went out to middle school and high school parents indicating that tomorrow would be a day that schedules for the middle school and high school would be released. Uh, Mrs. Horowitz did send a reminder tweet or a clarification tweet out indicating that the middle school schedules will be released next Tuesday. This goes back to the careful planning that we're doing and making sure that we are, we have everything in place. So when we're communicating with you, we're giving you information that 
we hope would not then further be changed. So a little extra time was needed on the middle school side to get the schedules uh, in place. Mr. DeGenero will be releasing uh, some information to parents and students regarding their courses uh, at some point tomorrow. The elementary buildings, although a date hasn't been set, will be um, communicating with you regarding when the class lists will be sent for the elementary buildings, but it will be at some point next week. Thank you for that. Uh, with regard to some of the other question, also, uh, I believe PPS is going to be sending out schedules to verify start dates at some point next week as well. Uh, there were some questions about confirmation of remote learning. I signed up for the remote learning. I didn't receive confirmation. Actually, when, when you submitted the form, you did. It, it said your form has been recorded and it has been recorded. We'll follow up with a more official correspondence, um, most likely very early next week. However, if, if you did register and then you don't receive a confirmation by the middle of next week, uh, actually you will, you'll, one way or the other, you'll receive a schedule at some point uh, by next week. And then if it's not accurate, please do reach out to the school and we'll make sure that we address and correct that. With regard to the actual instruction that's happening, uh, we'll speak to it elementary and secondary. So when we speak elementary, I'm going to talk more K-6, K-5, K-6. And when we speak secondary, it's more 612 or 712. So at the elementary level, there is instruction that's happening, obviously, in person for the in-person hybrid component. There's remote learning that's happening both for the fully uh, students who are fully remote and the students who are on the remote day of their hybrid learning program. Uh, new learning will happen every day. We will have, if you're in school proper, then certainly you will have instruction happening every day. Your teacher will be there. It'll look different. It absolutely will look different. The space in the class, um, the masks, which are a requirement, I'll, I'll state that again, the masks are a requirement. The classroom will look a little different. The furniture, it's more desks and chairs at this point. We have distanced the desks and uh, we have removed some of the furniture in the classroom so that we can ensure that we have enough desks in the classroom. Students who are home will learn live and synchronously for a portion of the day. So we're looking at some combination of, of, of math and English language arts and a morning meeting held live during the day, and that'll be given. Uh, we're working with um, some of our teachers and some of our, our specialists to ensure that that happens. Some students in, uh, students in the fully remote model will have a teacher who, who is their assigned fully remote teacher. Again, math, English language arts, and morning meetings, and then some other opportunities throughout the course of the day. So that will all take place, that will all be communicated, that will all be detailed, we're working through the final stages of it. But I, I've said this before, I'll say this again, children will not be expected to be on the computer for five hours a day. The, the, that's, in my opinion, that's way too much. The research, um, I, I can't find research that supports having children on a computer all day um, is beneficial. And in, in, in fact, I think many would find quite the opposite. With regard to the secondary level, there'll be an element of screen sharing that happens so that we can have um, our students remote in to many of their classes. Again, children will not be on all day, all period, all day. They will not be on all period, all day. I just wanna make sure that I communicate that very clearly. The children will not be expected to be on their computer for five or six or seven hours during the day. However, on the flip side of that, while we are giving some flexibility, there are live synchronous expectations at all levels, kindergarten to 12th grade. So students who are home, whether it's fully remote or whether it's on the remote day of the hybrid model, the expectation is that they will go on to their class meets at specific times during the day. And it will be multiple times during the course of the day. So there is an expectation that while we are affording some level of flexibility, we do expect students to be on live synchronously at various points during the day. So I share that with you. Some of the other questions have come up with regard to, um, will new learning happen on the hybrid days, on the remote days? Yes, new learning will happen 
on the remote days. We expect our students to learn when they're in school and we expect students to continue the learning and new learning when they're not um, in, on their school day, when they're on their remote day. With regard to some of the other questions that we have received, with regard to masks, uh, the question comes up constantly, uh, how we'll enforce the mask wearing that will be addressed through the code of conduct. The board has passed some uh, strong policies that require the wearing of masks and, and that require the adherence to the school district's reopening plans and the safety measures that are outlined within the reopening plan. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased by those measures. I think those measures will go a long way in helping us to provide the safest possible atmosphere for our students. We are, lockers have come up, questions about lockers at the middle school and high school level and will we have locker usage? We're, we're looking at eliminating locker usage for the coming school year. When you think about the times during the day where students gather and, and congregate outside of a lunch period or, or an available period within the instructional day, the lockers are a concern in terms of gathering. So that's something that we're hoping to minimize. That will help with congestion in the hallway. It'll help in traffic with the hallway. It'll, it'll help in so many different facets of the operations of the building and to keep the students moving through the building. With regard to the density of, of, of the building, I do want to share that our remote learning plan, our fully remote plan has under has over 500 students in it. So we're over 550 students or so who K through 12. So across 13 grade levels, those students are, are spread. And the remote learning, one of the questions that has come up is can there be an in-person orientation for students who have elected the fully remote model? The answer to that question is no. Uh, we are not going to have a f an in-person component to the fully remote program. The decision to go to a fully remote model is one of safety. It, it was one made, and, and I heard this from so many parents who called to say, Dr. Hatter, I just want you to know that, that I really respect the steps that the district is taking. I, I really am impressed by everything that you have done to provide the safest atmosphere for our students. And it's certainly not me, it's our team who, that have done this. However, we're concerned. We're a little worried, we're nervous. We live in a multi-generational household. We have someone in the household who's immunocompromised. We have someone in the household who has multiple comorbidities and we're concerned. And I understand that. And that's why our district was one of the first districts in the region to offer a fully remote model. It's a, just a profound sensitivity and respect for the circumstances that many within our community face. We understand that. Uh, and we, we're, we're completely understanding of, of individuals who proceed with the fully remote model. But that choice has been made for a reason. Uh, that choice has been made for the reason of safety. So to then bring children in and our faculty and staff also are, are um, so there, there are similar considerations for faculty and staff who are teaching in a remote model. So we're respectful of the circumstances. The orientations for fully remote students will be virtual. They will not be in person. So when I look at the 15th of September and it says in-person student orientation for group A students in K469, well, group A is within the hybrid model. If you're an A day or a B day or a group A, group B student, you're in the hybrid model. The fully remote students are not participating in the in-person orientations on the 15th and 16th. So I, I, I hope that that provides clarification uh, because that question was raised multiple times. With regard to some of the other questions that have been raised. Some have been raised about the bus and transportation and how do you socially distance on the bus. Our enrollment in the school buildings is inherently reduced. So for example, a school, our elementary schools have about 500 children in them. Some have a little bit more, some have a few less, but about 500 children is a safe number. Approximately 100 in each school has gone to remote learning. 
it's actually a little less than 100, but for round numbers sake, uh, we'll, we'll call it 100 children have gone with a fully remote model. So we have 400 students ready to come into school. Half have gone into the A day group, the other half have gone into the B day group or group B. And I use those synonymously, A day group A and then B day group B, they're synonymous here. So we have approximately 200 children on any given day. Now, mind you, this is a building that accommodates 500 students on a normal school day. So we're down to 200, so we're at about 40% of the capacity that, that where we've been. So of those 200 students on any given day, we will have the same number of buses running on a given day. And of those students who are coming to school, not all will take the bus. In fact, that's what I'm hearing most from parents is uh, that they will send their children to school, but they're going to hold off on the bus for the time being. And I understand that and we respect that. So the buses will inherently have a reduced capacity and occupancy just as a function of the reduced enrollment as part of the hybrid model and as part of the fully remote model. So I share that with you. With uh, regard to the supervised remote learning center, I've been getting questions on that. When is that registration opening? How are you determining uh, when registration is full? Tell me about the screening that you're going to have at the start. What will they do in the program? So I'll just share a little information. This is just for kindergarten to fifth, sixth grade, K to six. The cost of the program is $45 per day. It's going to be paid on a monthly basis. We're going to use the My School Bucks lunch system to process the payments because we don't have any other mechanism to collect payments. With regard to the payments, please understand that the district can't profit on this. We legally can't profit. We legally can't take a loss on this. So we have assessed what our costs are to operate the program. We have ascribed a dollar amount to that per student and that's what we'll be collecting. We are hoping to turn this over. And also there is no busing to French Hill. There is no transportation that would be, be provided. It's an eight to four day. Uh, students will arrive as early as 8 a.m. They will be picked up as late as 4 p.m. Uh, we are working with a third party. And, and this, again, this is a courtesy program that we're offering. I, I have had some reach out and say, well, I, I need to go to work at seven o'clock. I understand that this program may not be the appropriate program to meet the needs in that circumstance. And, and I understand that and, and, and I empathize with that. And hopefully there is another provider within our community who can meet those needs. Now, when the third party program, and I believe the board will be awarding um, or, or certainly reviewing the respondents to the RFP and, and the recommendation that I'll be making Monday evening at their meeting, when the third party takes it over and the district is no longer overseeing the program, then that's something that they certainly will have the option to do, offer an earlier drop off or a later pickup. And that would be a cost that they would work out. It would not be the base cost of eight to four would remain at $45. They have agreed to keep that. That was a part of the requirements for the uh, RFPs that we issued, the RFP that we issued. When students arrive, so there is no transportation that will be provided. Uh, it, it's, it's going to be treated as uh, an additional program that, that the district is overseeing temporarily. Now, the registration I anticipate will come out tomorrow. The first 100 people who sign up for A-Day, registration is going to close. We'll hold a waiting list in case uh, it doesn't materialize for, for a student, and then we'll hold a B-Day registration as well simultaneously. And uh, again, there'll be a waiting list just in case uh, all of the registrations don't come through, there'll be a waiting list there as well. Once the 100 spots are filled, uh, again, the registration will be closed, the waiting list will be opened. With regard to the screening when students arrive, they will have to go through screening. The screening will be performed by AFC Urgent Care. They will be on site in the morning to check temperatures, blood oximetry, pulse oximetry. It's the device that goes on the index finger to check the um, oxygenation of, of blood. And that will determine whether students are able to be accepted into the program on that day. 
if a student becomes ill or if a student's denied admission, they must go home with, uh, with a family member that day. So we are working to finalize those details. That was something that um, was purely optional for our school district. School districts did not have to provide a childcare program, but it was a profound sensitivity to the members of our community and a genuine concern from the school district toward our community. And that's what led us to essentially open up another school. It will not have the same infrastructure that our schools have. And I share that with you in, in full candor and, and in full transparency. It will not have um, the air conditions necessarily in every room that we have in the other buildings that are outfitted with the MERV 13 filtration. It will not have the same security set up it's still a secure building, but but not the same secure level of security in our school buildings. We are in the process of installing some Wi-Fi hubs, but the Wi-Fi may not be as fast as it is in our schools. And we understand that and we're going to continue to work to grow that. However, the safety measures that we take, the masks will be required all day. The social distancing will be required. The desks will be spaced apart. The facility will be disinfected daily. Every night, the facility will be disinfected. So um, those broadest safety measures will be there, but, it, but it's not the same as um, the measures that we're taking within our schools that include the MERV 13 filtration, the unit ventilators that are introducing the fresh air, uh, the portable sinks that we're introducing. We will certainly have masks and, and PPE available in the program, but um, we, we have taken some additional measures even above and beyond what the state has prescribed for, uh, for our, our five schools here. Uh, Mrs. O'Shea, are there any other questions or any other items that we were going to discuss that maybe I haven't raised yet? I'm wondering if we should provide a little clarity on the arrival of students to our building. Yes. Would you yeah. like to do that? Please, or? yeah, yeah. So we are preparing to welcome students and we're very anxious and, and excited to be able to do that. Um, every family who is sending students to school on their school day will be asked to fill out an attestation answering a couple of questions that indicate any, are there any symptoms evident and, and to, uh, and is there any fever above 100? That information will be collected electronically. That's one measure that we will have in place to be sure that students entering our building are um, safe and healthy to do so. If a parent answers the question on behalf of a student and indicates that there are system uh, symptoms or there is a fever, that child will be asked to stay home. The school will get that information in the morning uh, prior to uh, at the student's arrival. We will also be starting the year taking temperatures as a double check of all students at, uh, entering and visitors entering our building. That'll be another safety measure for us. Because this process might take a little longer as we're entering students from the buses, from the parents um, who might be driving in, we will be setting up specific times for drop off and pick up that will be um, maybe a little bit different than they've been in the past for specific buildings. So we are looking to just make sure that children entering the, into the building are healthy and are um, ready to be in school. So those processes will be in place and we'll certainly share more information about that as we get closer to the opening of school. Yeah, those few minutes uh, at the front end of the day to stagger the arrivals, the few minutes at the back end of the day or are important to help with the congestion because we do have so few openings um, in terms of days, uh, in terms of um, doors to access the building. I, I do just want to reiterate in terms of safety, one of the questions that came up was with regard to all of these entrances, multiple entrances. First of all, we're not going to have five or six entrances to each school. So I do want to temper that expectation. There will be two, maybe a third entrance to some of our schools. And once student arrival has concluded, the doors are all locked. We're back to a single point of entry. We will have the safety personnel at the uh, top of each driveway. We will have the safety personnel inside in the vestibules within the buildings and they will be a single point of entry. And then we return to the similar security structure that we have in place in our buildings. So I did want to reassure our community of that, that we're not 
that we are cognizant. We absolutely are cognizant of, in light of, in spite of, regardless of the COVID um, situation, security is still a very important factor for us in the operations of our schools. So I do want to make sure that I communicated that appropriately. With regard to some of the other questions that have come up, there will be ninth period in the high school. Earth science students will follow the eighth grade calendar. They will not follow the ninth grade calendar. So they will follow whatever it is for an eighth grader. That has historically been the trend. And I would also ask and, and encourage anyone who views this to go back in and look at the schedule. Uh, there have been some clarifications that have been made within the schedule so that um, some of the questions that have arisen are addressed within the calendar. So I would encourage you to go back and take a look at the calendar if, if you had a source of confusion. If that source of confusion remains, please do contact me. You're, you're welcome to call my office or, or send me an email so that I can um, clarify the specific question on the calendar that you have. You're also welcome to go into the FAQ. That's probably the best place to go is the FAQ. And uh, that's where we're going in to pull most of our questions. Unfortunately, the volume of emails from PPE vendors and, and from different organizations that just want to assist us in the reopening or, and more importantly, questions that have come in regarding the reopening of school have just created a, a bit of a delay in response to emails. So the FAQ is where we'll have multiple people going in and looking at the questions and incorporating those into our presentations and into our protocols and procedures. So. With that said, we shared a lot of information tonight. This will all be posted to our website. Um, and I'll just, I'll close by, by sharing that we recognize how uneasy of a time this is. We look around, not just in our own community, but in other communities, and we see the stress uh, and the frustration and the fear that, that many have. It's not easy. It really isn't. And I think we all share in that. We, we share in that for ourselves, for our children. And what, what I just want to share with you is our commitment to your children and to our faculty and staff. Is our reopening plan perfect? No, I haven't found a reopening plan that is perfect. They're all imperfect in some way. I do believe that our plan is amongst the best that I have seen. And I think the steps we're taking specifically in slowing down the start of the year, essentially by six days, that's what this boiled down to was six days for the vast majority of our school district. And for students who are on, on the uh, eighth, 11th and 12th grade level, it's a little bit longer. And for students on the fourth, sixth, ninth and K level, it's less, it's four days for those students. So this is an investment. It really is an investment in providing just another level of safety for our school district. That, because that's what this is about, is reopening safely. Anyone can reopen schools and anyone can um, welcome students back. And, and our hope is that our plan will keep students here in the longer term. I'd like things to get better rather than get worse. Can I promise you that will be the case? No, I'd be disingenuous if I did that. But what I can do is, is promise you that the planning that we're doing will position us well. The PPE and the safety measures that we're taking will position us better to do that and to reach that goal. Hindsight will be 2020 in all of this. And speaking of 2020, the good news is it's more than two thirds of the way over and we can look forward into 2021 and, and hopefully for a better year for, for everyone. So I thank you all. I appreciate you joining. Uh, this will be posted to our website. I encourage you to watch it. And if you have any um, questions on the schedule, please go back into the schedule because it has been amended to provide uh, some clarifications based on some of the questions that, that were shared with me. So I thank you all. Uh, I wish you a wonderful evening, a wonderful weekend and stay well, everyone. Good night.